Hello, humans. Welcome to the part of the show where Fraser madly types the introduction. Madly types it. Done. Okay, cool. I am just pulling up the... This news. one won't make you laugh out loud. Well, you but succeeded I was, I was so well last to, week. I know. I always consider that to be like like what I'm aiming for is I, I need Pamela to chortle. <laughs> I deeply appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I figured that's my measurement. If you get a laugh, then, or if you laugh, then hopefully the audience will also laugh. It's true. But not everything is funny. Uh, Today okay. is... 681. Yup. I am missing my audio software. There it is. There is a dog panting like the world is ending in the background because she was having fun in the yard and it is it is warm and she is excited. So we had this is funny. So so about a week ago, I had to do an, an interview with somebody and it was at the exact same time that some people were here doing some some work on the house. And mm -hmm. so Carla escaped into the studio with me and she she was hanging out here and she had her headphones on she was just listening to something and the dog was asleep and snoring <laughs> and she didn't notice that the dog was asleep <laughs> and snoring and i was like okay i hope my mic doesn't pick this up and so i've had a couple people go like what's that sound in the interview <laughs> and it was a snoring dog and she didn't notice um i didn't want to sort of stop the interview go Stop that dog from snoring. So, yeah. What, what I love is my neighborhood is filled with people who own dogs. And there's a bloodhound down the street that if it howls, my dogs are going to howl. Mm. And, and the other day I heard Malachi start with, so it starts with a fire truck. There's always a fire truck involved. So first you hear the fire truck off in the distance. And then the bloodhound starts in. And then Malachi started in. And then Eddie, who doesn't know why he's howling, is howling because Malachi is howling. And then Stella, who had been dead asleep inside the house, hears mm -hmm. them through the open window. And now all the dogs are howling. And it's this delightful, only one of them knows why. Only one. Right. Yeah. But they're all yeah. going to howl. Well, see, I have, we have deaf dog. So yeah. no problem with any of that. Like our dog does not pick up on anything. And you, every now and then you're like, Are, is she really deaf? Oh and yeah. And then you'll do things like you'll run the blender right beside her at high volume. And she doesn't, <laughs> doesn't do anything. So yeah. yeah. Well and truly completely 100% utterly deaf. I, I had a deaf dog. It was fabulous and terrible simultaneously. Um, yeah, yeah. Just like your your total lack of control. You cannot summon this dog back. If the dog gets away from you, gone. You have to just rely on that dog. Just it occurring to them that maybe it would like to return. Yeah. yeah. All right. I don't have a lot of time because I've, I'm gardening and I have to get back into the garden. So. Um, <laughs> And the rain is coming. So, um, but let's uh, hustle through this episode. All right. So, me. Sorry, everybody, for doing this at a non standard time, but uh, Pamela's going to be traveling tomorrow. Yeah. So, all right. I am pressing record. I am pressing the other record. We are recording. All right. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 681, Kilonovic. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, a weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. With me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of Cosmoquest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I, I am doing well. I am having the meteor shower full moon sads, though. This, this weekend, there, there was theoretically going to be an outburst of Ada Aquarids and there was a full moon instead. Yep. I yeah. have the full moon sads. Uh, yeah. How do we destroy the moon? How do we make this happen? I think that's, it's important. We, I we, think Vanta point, Black. 
Can we just vant a black the moon? Just paint the moon. Just paint the moon. Black. It would super yeah. heat, heat it to be fair, so all the infrared astronomers would hate us. But like right. us optical folks, we'd still have tides. Yeah. We'd still have all the physics that we need that the moon supports. Yeah. Vanta Black is the answer. Okay, people. there we go. So so before we destroy the moon, let's just paint it black, and that uh -huh. will that will and that that way people who like tides and stuff will still be all right. Okay, good call. In 2017, astronomers detected the gravitational waves and electromagnetic radiation from colliding neutron stars. This had been long theorized as one of the causes of a certain type of gamma ray burst. By studying the event and its afterglow, astronomers have learned a tremendous amount about the formation of the heaviest elements in the universe. And we will talk about it in a second, but it's time for a break. And we're back. So we've i think we've talked about this before for from my perspective the announcement and discovery of the kilanova was the best kept secret known by about five thousand people in the yes. field of astronomy and like when you hear about those conspiracy theories and you're like you know two people can't can only keep a secret if one of them's dead yes i was caught completely flat-footed uh -huh. by the announcement of the Kilanova. And it is my job to sense the scuttlebutt of yes. what's going on. You knew in advance that this was coming, right? I, I, I knew parts of it in advance, but the fullness of how basically one in three active research astronomers globally were yeah. involved in this discovery, the, the sheer number and the fact that it was detected over gamma rays and optical and particle science, the, the fullness of the discovery yeah. was one of those things where it was like, huh, that was bigger than I thought. It Every was, particle it was physicist. Amazing. Yeah. All these particle physicists, all of the people working in the gravitational wave astronomy, and then every astronomer associated with every major observatory both on land and in space yes were part of these observations yes. and part of the science paper i've never seen a science paper with so many names associated with it and those are just like the primary people from each working group not to mention all of the other people who were involved in detecting it analyzing it yeah it was uh, hats off to the astronomy community for for working on this and i guess like I guess the conspiracies are all real then. Clip that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not all right. going there. So what was the uh, so what was the killer? T t talk about the the event. What happened? So so back in 2017, there were uh, two neutron stars, two remnants of massive stars, but not so massive that they became black holes. These these two neutron stars, I. Uh, they had been spiraling towards each other, giving off gravitational waves over time. And it's that release of energy in the form of gravitational waves that causes them to spiral in towards each other. And one fateful August day, the signals of this merger occurring reached our world and literally, I'm, I can't say shook it, but I can say warped it stretched it and compressed it yeah yeah so so as these two signal these two stars uh reached the point of of merging together becoming a black hole they released a massive amount of energy in the form of gravitational waves that were detected by LIGO, Virgo, these gravitational wave detectors on our planet as the planet literally getting stretched and compressed in a damped harmonic oscillation. Yeah. It also released a whole lot of neutrons, neutrinos, because there was a vast creation of what are called our process elements. We'll return to that in a bit. Mm -hmm. So we had yeah. particles getting here. And at the same time, the, the, the first optical signal of this was a flash or a first photonic signal of this was a very short blast of gamma rays that were then followed by an optical afterglow. And 
When I say a short burst of gamma rays, I mean it was less than two seconds in duration. Wow. Okay. So g give us kind of a timeline from from detection of the different classes of of waves. So what's what's wild here is they had to piece together after the fact that that all of these things were were tied together. So there was the almost simultaneous measurement of the gravitational waves and the gamma rays. So the first thing that happens as these stars merge is is the flash of light and the release of gamma ray energy, not gamma ray, gravitational energy. After this, you have the slower moving particles. Particles can't move at the speed of light. And you also have coming afterwards the residual glow of things going on around where the merger took place. So this is the kind of event that stretched out over time, both in arrival of the information and also in being able to follow it evolve over time. The thing that I find just absolutely amazing was not only did we get this this multimodal detection of these two of in gravitational waves and electromagnetic yeah. radiation, but we got like the first definitive proof that gravity moves at the speed of light. Yes, and and right and like big question in astronomy solved. Yes, th this is something that that we've been struggling as a profession to prove for a long period of time and we've gone to great mathematical and geometric ends to try and say well the light from this gravitational from this quasar was gravitationally bent in a way that indicates as Jupiter was moving and it it's never enough proof but when you get the gravitational waves and you get the gamma waves getting here within our ability to detect at the same time. Well, and, and not even just at the same time, like the gravitational waves come from the last few milliseconds yeah. of the neutron stars orbiting around each other before they actually collide. That's when you get the gravitational waves. And then moments after you get the electromagnetic radiation from their collision and the explosion. And so, you know, if the waves and the electromagnetic rays came at exactly the same time, then in fact, they wouldn't be moving at the same speed. But because you got the, the yes. waves, then the light, it lines up perfectly. And when you think that these this light was moving hundreds of millions of light years to get to us with that level of precision, they move the same speed. It, it was one of those truly amazing, all of the clocks were actually in sync kind of discoveries. All right, we're going to talk about this some more, but it is time for another break. And we're back. So let's talk about this mystery of gamma ray bursts and how this helps explain what those one class of them are. So so we started discovering gamma ray bursts back in the early days of the Cold War when there had been a nuclear test ban treaty passed that said basically you shall not test nuclear weapons in the air or in outer space. And to monitor whether or not that was actually happening, we launched satellites sensitive to the kinds of gamma ray light that come out during nuclear explosions, which also have our process elements, just we're going to still come back to that. Now, unfortunately, um, it turned out that for the first time ever, we discovered once above the atmosphere that there are natural sources of gamma rays and the early detectors were not good enough to nail down what direction gamma rays were coming from. So there was a bit of, oh dear, what's going on, that luckily we quickly realized that gamma rays appear to be coming from all directions on the sky in different durations. And over the years, with satellite after satellite after satellite, we've built up this understanding that there are essentially two broad categories of gamma ray bursts, those that can last many seconds to many minutes. These are your long gamma ray bursts. And then there are the short gamma ray bursts that appear to actually break into two different groups. These are the ones that are two seconds or less. Right. Now, the, the long ones, we, we blame those on hypernova. 
astronomers shouldn't name things. We're really, really bad at it. Are you, are you kidding me? <laughs> like that, that's the best name. Well, like <laughs> Mega Nova, Ultra Nova, so, Giga Nova. Yes, please, more of that. So Supernova is fine. Like I, I think they nailed it. Supernova, they they got a good name out the door there. Hypernova. That's just <laughs> that's just taking a win. And then taking a victory lap. So I 100% agree with you. When I think about the poorly named cosmological objects out there. Oh, yeah. Hypernova? No way. It's just, this, this feels like how do you torture your undergrads? We have classical nova, cataclysmic variables, nova nova, recurrent nova, hypernova, kilonova, supernova. And then we just add letters to stuff. Mm. Yeah. You're good with this. Okay. I'm, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> Hyper. No. Yes. Okay. Yes, I'm okay, fine, fine with that. Are you, fine. Not only am I fine with that, I think it is one of the best named objects in all of astronomy. All right. Anyways, so there are hypernovae, which produce prolonged gamma ray bursts. And there, there's two general theories about what's going on here. In one case, you have a um, massive star going supernova and its mass attacks a nearby companion that is probably a neutron star and as it falls onto the neutron star this creates massive jets of gamma rays that's one possible idea the other possible idea is that this is simply a special kind of fast rotating massive star that is capable of generating these jets all on its own Whichever scenario it is, these create massive optical afterglows that we've been able to see since the 90s. And they're long enough that we have time to catch them in the gamma rays, spin something around to look at them in x-rays, and zero in on where they are in the, in the sky very successfully. These things, easy to observe in the grand scheme of hard to observe objects. Because mm -hmm. they're just so bright. Exactly. Then the other not a kilonova gamma ray burst is it looks like some of the sources that cause fast radio bursts also cause bursts of gamma ray radiation. And these can be things like highly magnetic neutron stars that are called magnetars rearranging their magnetic field and releasing massive short-lived bursts of energy. One of these occurred back in December of 2004. It was bright enough that it passed through the sides of telescopes. In between the two of these kinds of objects, this is where our two neutron stars coming together to produce heavy elements exist. All right. Uh, I know you're raring to talk about the R process, and so we will talk about that in a second, <laughs> but it's for another break. And we're back. All right. Hit us. What exactly is going on as these two neutron stars come together? So... The glorious thing about it is these stars get, to a certain degree, completely shredded as they coalesce. And, and the tidally disrupted neutrons, they're, they're flung out during that catastrophic explosion of a merger. And they hit the surrounding material. And if you take your friendly everyday atom and you bombard it with neutrons fast enough, it doesn't have a chance to undergo what's called inverse beta decay. This is where your typical everyday neutron is like, I don't like to exist by myself. You take mm -hmm. a neutron, you put it on a shelf. It's like, no. And it becomes an electron. five minutes yeah. later and it's gone. Exactly. It decays into an electron and a proton. Now, if you take an atom and you bombard it fast enough with all of these neutrons, they build up, they build up, they build up, and then they switch identities. And when they do, suddenly the core of this atom goes from being your random everyday low on the periodic table atom to something crazy like Einsteinium. And, and so this rapid release of neutrons that assault and make themselves part of the nuclei of heavy elements in the surrounding materials 
allows us to get even heavier elements. And this is one of the only ways to do it. And what I love is this, this is a story that builds up over the entire lifetime of these stars, because massive stars have massive solar winds, they blast material in all directions around them. And that material hanging out around them, that's where these heavy elements get to form. And it's just a cool story. Yeah, so you've got this, I mean, just think about the forces involved that you're taking a neutron star, one of the densest objects in the universe and you're turning it into a neutron slurry yes as these neutron stars are coming together because tremendous forces involved and then the neutrons are crashing into other neutrons and there's so much energy compacted in a small space that they're just getting assembled into uh -huh. larger heavier elements like gold and yes. this is one of the, this was one of the most incre incredible things they saw earth's worth of gold in the explosion. And prior to confirming the reality of these things, like it, they'd been predicted in the late 90s that this should be a thing that happens out there somewhere. But when I was in grad school, I'm old, I was in grad school in the 90s and early 2000s, we were taught that these heavy elements came from massive stars exploding as supernova, add your letters and numbers after it. Right. And and this whole idea of combining neutron stars, it, it wasn't something that was just regularly taught. And now we know that the reason supernova modelers were having so much trouble in the 90s reproducing the matter we see in the universe is supernova aren't to blame. It's it's hmm. these neutron stars coming together. And it's just a really cool way that science pretty much overnight was like, yeah, and we were wrong. And now we right. know. Now, but we can't blame all the gold on no. Kilinova, can no. we? No. So there... There's, there is still our process going on yes. in some of the most heavy stars. And that is also contributing to the heavier it's it's the overall production ratios where we have to start saying, okay, so let's look around the solar system, let's add up how much carbon we have, let's add up how much iron we have, let's add up how much technetium we have. And when we make this abundance curve of, of how much exists of each atomic isotope in our solar system, then we start doing the, okay, so what, what supernovae do you have to have go off to cause this to happen? And so you say, this kind of supernova is going to produce this ratio of ingredients. This is going to produce this ratio of ingredients. And to reproduce what we see, you have to have these kilonova out there that are dedicated super heavy atom producers. Mm. And, and so it's just you need different kinds of factories producing different ratios that all together add up to the solar system we're in. Right, right. And so now that we know about this, what role do we think that a kilonova had on the formation of the solar system and the, the gold in our wedding rings and, <laughs> and electronics and, and things like that? Well, it, it starts to tell us that these have been happening for a long time, and they had to exist for us to be here. Um, I, I have to admit, I feel like this is one of those moments where you have read a key paper that I missed that said exactly how many kilonova what? went into our solar system. So there was a kilonova. So astronomers were able to essentially estimate that a kilonova went off about a, within a thousand, no, a thousand light years of us, closer, about a hundred million years before the solar system formed and delivered a tremendous amount of heavier elements into the solar system. So something within our galactic corner neighborhood in recent history before the solar system formed. And the, the thing that's really interesting is, is how these might be some of, you know, we always talk about like what it takes to start star formation in some nebula. Mm -hmm. And now it appears that there might very well be that you could have these, these kilonovas go off. They seed heavier elements and also kickstart the process of collapse in this nebula. 
And so at least one, probably multiple kilonova went into the formation of our solar system and gave us the heavier elements that we have all around us. And we probably wouldn't have life on Earth in the way that we understand it without those events. And that's... So they're, you know, they're doom, but they're also help with the formation of life. And that's a really cool story. One, one of the earliest examples that we had of what we thought might be a neutron-neutron star merger was back in 2013. And the reason that they were able to say, yes, we think this is a neutron star neutron star merger is it occurred in a galaxy we have a very loud dog in the background i'm going to repeat this thought when the dog is done all right so one of the reasons they were able to say back in 213 that we think this is a a neutron star merger is it occurred in a system that didn't have significant star formation. It was old, it was elliptical, it was consistent with a old stellar population that would have fully evolved neutron stars in it. Now, if there was a neutron star, neutron star merger within a thousand light years of the, the cloud of material that we formed out of, that gives you this amazing image of how old stars and unused material were mixing in the Milky Way and makes me question, could it have been like that kilonova or other related events from that super old population that triggered our molecular clouds collapse? And right. it's it's a multi-generational story. So there's a couple of, of recent tweaks on of this one is I don't know if you saw the story that that researchers were able to calculate that the kilonova was a perfectly spherical yes. explosion yes which I thought was really interesting because you would expect like they're coming in as I said the neutrons are turning into this kind of slurry as they're orbiting on this plane and you'd expect it to be the explosion to kind of match the collision but in fact the the explosion was perfectly spherical and and they figured that out by looking at the black body radiation, which would have had a different distribution of light if if there had been red shifting and blue shifting and going on. But no, it was just spherical. And and what's cool, though, is there was a slurry of material. And as some of it went out, that optical afterglow we were seeing was from some of the remainders coming back in. So you have this completely symmetric explosion. And then you have the material falling back in, doing the disk thing and self-destructing as an optical afterglow on the newly formed black hole's event horizon. Now, from what I understand, there's only been like just like maybe two more kilonova yeah. detected. Yeah. So we're at the very beginning of this science. And a big part of that is that LIGO is has been offline for the last couple of years but it's coming back yes. online in just a few months from now and with its next iteration and with the next iteration we're going to have greater sensitivity we're going to have uh, the chance to hopefully be sensitive to more and more of these kinds of objects and in combination with things like the Zwicky transient factory with Swift and Fermi still being healthy up in er up in orbit um and hopefully LSST, LSST, we need you return yes. while LIGO is still running on the next run. Um, or launch, start, return yeah. is, has nothing to do with it. But yeah, 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 yeah. We have this incredible opportunity to do observations of an extreme event that helped deliver the essential heavier elements into the universe. And we are months away from the next iteration of LIGO. Like, like originally they detected like one or two events. Yeah. The, then they did an upgraded version and they were detecting one a week. And now we've got the new version coming out in just a few months that should crank that up even to the next level. Yeah. There are several gravitational wave events a week. Yeah. Yeah. The, the most optimistic I've seen is there are, hopes of maybe one a day getting noticed wow. yeah. yeah so those are the most optimistic end yeah, i yeah. i choose to be an optimist in terms mm -hmm. of, of yeah, yeah and hopefully a new class 
yeah yeah of, of of objects like neutron stars colliding with white dwarfs like yeah. maybe other parts of these gamma ray bursts that are there's still some controversy can go away once we do more and more of these observations so uh so stay tuned it's going to be an exciting year i think well thank you pebble Thank you. And thank you so much to everyone out there in our audience who supports us through Patreon. We, we could not do this without you. You allow us to have editors that make us sound good and get everything posted up on the internets so you can download us. If you would like us to, if you would like to help us support these people, please consider joining our Patreon and this will also get you ad-free versions of the show. This week, I would like to specifically thank Burry Gowan, Jordan Young, Stephen Veit, Nano Fleeps, Andrew Palestra, Venkatras Chari, Brian Cagle, David Trogue, Buzz Parsect, Les Howard, Laura Kettleson, Robert Plasma, Jack Mudge, Joe Holstein, Richard Drum, Greg Davis, Frank Tippin, Gordon Dewis, Alexis, Adam and Nice Brown, William Andrews Gold, Roland Vormerdam, Jeff Collins, and Kellyanne and David Parker. Thank you so much, all of you out there. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Bye bye. Then they saved. And then they saved. All right. Hello, aware of existing. Welcome to the chat. Is that in? On Twitch, Twitch yeah. Okay. <laughs> Broken Symmetry said it this way. Killanova ubered us gold. Uh, okay, so cop questions we got time for. Um, Corey S. asks, do the elements that form in the Kilanova travel fast enough to land here on Earth? Um, elements? I, I, so there. Like, are we, are Kilanova bits raining down on us all the time? So some of the cosmic rays that we get should be from Kilanova. And we get neutrinos but I, not like big blocks. we're not i like i'm trying to figure out like i wouldn't expect a chunk of einsteinium to come our right. direction this way this isn't how we're going to be able to build shields of vibranium or anything like that yeah but i mean the, the einsteinium has a What's the half life of Einsteinium? Very short. It, but it, if you're traveling close enough to the speed of light, yeah, it's still dead at that distance. But whoa, twenty days. Yeah, that's a crazy idea that you've got Einsteinium that is traveling at relativistic speeds. How far could it get before it decays from its perspective? I, I would have to do math. It could get a yeah. good distance. That's neat. Okay, Zapfan Zapfan is saying that there are supernova bits in ocean sediments, hafnium. Yeah. And yeah. and some of that gets thought to be that there is a supernova. I forget which extinction it was, that it was related to. There's mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. thoughts that we were closer to a supernova than one would wish to be at one point in the Earth's history. Yeah, like it's about a hundred and it's about a hundred light years. Just stay 100 light years away from the supernova. You'd be okay. Uh, all right. I think uh, so. I've got to go and clean up a bunch of tools before it rains. So I think we're going to call things right now. Okay. But thank you, everyone, for hanging out with us on this unusual Sunday, giving Pamela the time she needs to travel. Uh, anything interesting coming up that people should be aware of? Um, I am getting ready to record next Saturday's episode of Escape Velocity Space News, and we're going to be talking about all the new things that are slowly cropping up on how did we get the conditions for life that we need here on Earth, and how are we detecting them on worlds out among the stars. So we're yeah, going to chase cool. water, and we're going to chase the idea of, well, it's cool to think that in the 80s, if you said, I want to go fossil hunting on Mars, people would like condemn you. But today that's like, yeah, that's a realistic thing to dream yeah. of doing. Do it. Um, so I've got a couple of really interesting interviews that I have published in the last couple of weeks. One, if you look on my channel, it's this thing that says uh, 
solar sails are better than you think. Yeah. And this is an interview that I did with Dr. Slava Turashev. He's the idea behind the solar gravitational lens theory. And and so he's trying to figure out how to practically get a spacecraft out to the solar gravitational lens of like 600 astronomical units away from the sun. And so they come up with this solar sail concept. But what's amazing is when you read the paper, everybody is is on this paper. So you've got Carolyn Porco, you've got Mike Brown and Constantine Batigan, you've got everyone from the New Horizons team, like anyone who's interested in in exploration of the outer solar system has pitched in on this paper to say yes, please, high velocity solar sails to explore the outer solar system would be amazing. So it's you just come out of that interview and you just have so much hope and joy for the future of, of space exploration. So definitely check that one out on my channel. And and I want to know if you have a rant at some point about how New Horizons was funded strictly to do helioscience for the next two years. We so well we covered this on Universe Today and we broke the story. Really? So I feel really proud. Yeah, we broke the story. I think we covered it, we put it up three weeks ago. Okay. And uh, so I guess, or I'm also angry that we break a story and we don't get any credit for it, maybe. Um, but yeah, no, so Carolyn Collins Peterson, who is just an outstanding science journalist, had had been hearing the scuttlebutt about this story and had reported extensively, talked to Alan Stern, talked to other people, didn't get a response from NASA, um, but had just a really incredible, well-researched story and it's been up on universe today for three weeks now that is excellent and, and now other people are getting the story so like just we get it all first we're the best <laughs> you really do we you really we're the do best. We're the, so, uh, but it but it is it's really strange to me like again like it, it's like if you break a story in a in a field where nobody is paying attention then did, did you really break it did you really uh, find the story? And so like they're they're piling up now. Like I probably get one story a week where everyone's talking about it. And I'm like, we covered this. So now I can't cover it because then like we already did it. But then I look like I'm not up to date, but like check our archive anyway. Anyway, that that's my rant. So um, you need to have a box on on your your homepage that says covered first here where right. where you put in these things Maybe you've already so. yeah scoop yeah. yeah yeah possibly uh right okay well thank you everyone for hanging out with us today and pamela thank you so much for bringing the brain thanks in advance to our all all of the audio and video people who are yeah. going to work on this and we will see all of you at the appropriate time next week Right? You'll be yes. back by then? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Okay. We'll see you later. <laughs> bye bye. Have a safe trip. I'm I'm sure gonna try. All right.